Chapter 19, An Amazing Passageway The whole affair took an unexpected turn. Nancy went up to Mrs. Holman and hugged her. You were right all along. The phantom literally goes through the walls. Oh, bless you, the housekeeper said, tears in her eyes. I'm glad that someone believes me. George, always practical, asked, but which wall? Mr. Rorick stood stupefied. He seemed completely unable to believe what had happened. Again, the phantom had taken his money without any visible means of entrance and exit. The elderly man shook his head in dismay. Finally, Nancy answered George's question. As you know, I have searched this room thoroughly, and the police have too. There's one place left that the thief may use. A spot I thought was impossible. What's that? Bess asked. The chimney. But how could the phantom get through solid brick? Bess argued. George snapped her fingers. When we were up on the roof, Dave said the flue slanted toward the outside of the chimney. Could that have anything to do with it? It certainly could, Nancy replied. I wish I'd known this before. She looked up the flue in the library, then dashed out to the hall and into the dining room. In a few moments, she was back. The flues are far apart from left to right as you stand in front of this fireplace, she reported. I wonder if by any chance there could be an opening between them which runs from here into the dining room. Everyone gazed at the wooden paneling which covered the fireplace wall from ceiling to mantel. For the first time, Nancy realized that the mantel shelf was very wide wide enough for a person to stand on. Grabbing the shelf with both hands, she pulled herself up and began tapping each panel. Suddenly, a broad smile lighted up her face. There's a small section here that sounds hollow, she exclaimed. Nancy hunted for a long time for a hidden spring. She pushed on various sections of each panel and also tried to raise or slide them, but she failed to detect anything which might open a hidden door. The young sleuth refused to give up. Although the panels were tightly wedged together, Nancy was sure there was some mechanism hidden between the two of them. Bess, will you find me the thinnest nail file you can? She requested. In less than a minute, Bess was back with an almost paper-thin one. Carefully, Nancy tried inserting it between a hollow-sounding panel and the one next to it. Suddenly, her efforts were rewarded. The nail file pressed out a wafer-thin metal lever, and at the same moment, the whole section above the center of the fireplace swung outward. It swept Nancy to the floor. You've done it! You found it! Bess cried ecstatically as she helped Nancy to her feet. The whole group gazed into a dark, narrow passageway, which they felt sure opened into the dining room. We'll find out in a minute, Nancy said, running from the room. The others followed. Nancy removed the candlesticks from the dining room mantel shelf. Then she climbed up and inserted the nail file in the section that backed up the one above the fireplace in the library. A long, narrow door, reaching from the ceiling to the shelf, opened outward. Mr. Rorick was flabbergasted. This is one secret which was never passed down in the family, he declared. But someone else learned about it, said George. Yippee! Nancy has solved the mystery of the phantom. He climbed through the passageway from the dining room, did his burglarizing and searching, then climbed up, closed the secret door behind him, and let himself out here. Mrs. Holman, who had been speechless all this time, now found her voice. The police should be notified at once and come here to catch that criminal. 
Before anyone else could answer her, Nancy said, Oh, please don't do that. I want to catch him myself. Not just to capture him, but to see if I can find out what else he has been searching for. She looked pleadingly at Mr. Rorick. Finally, he said, I think we owe it to Nancy Drew to let her have her way. But there must be restrictions and a time limit. Don't take any chances. And if you don't capture him by tomorrow, then I feel I ought to notify the authorities. Nancy was ready to put a plan into action at once. When will Fred be here again working in the house? She asked Mrs. Holman. I expect him early this afternoon. Nancy smiled. That will be perfect. She suggested that after Fred arrived, the others were to talk about two subjects. First, that Mrs. Holman and Mr. Rorick would be gone for the afternoon and that the three girls would drive out into the country and not return for several hours. The other was for Uncle John to announce loudly that he had brought some valuable jewelry back with him and would lock it in the safe before leaving. If Fred is helping his father or someone else, he'll immediately pass the word along. I'm sure that either he or a confederate will come into the library to take the jewelry. She went on to say that Mrs. Holman was to telephone the house at a certain time and ask Fred to carry a large amount of trash out to a certain place in the woods. While he was gone, the three girls would sneak back, go through the secret passageway, and hide themselves behind sofa and chairs in the library. Uncle John thought a few moments before giving his consent to the plan. I suppose it won't be dangerous with three girls against one small man. Nancy and her friends smiled. George, to show her enthusiasm, said, I'm going to make a trial trip through that passageway. She pulled herself to the mantel shelf and started inside. She was forced to crouch a bit. Suddenly, George gave a whoop of elation. Uncle John, I found your coin collection. She appeared at the opening to the dining room, carrying several large coin collector's books. George handed them down to Mr. Rorick, who kept murmuring, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. George went on, I wonder why the thief didn't take these along with him. Nancy ventured an answer. Probably he was afraid to carry them to his home. They're pretty large to conceal. Anyway, he wouldn't dare dispose of many coins at a time, and what better hiding place could he have than this passage? By the way, Uncle John, can you tell at a quick glance how much has been taken out? Mr. Rorick quickly turned the pages of the various books, then smiled in relief. The thief took only a few hundred dollars worth. The most valuable coins are still intact. I suppose I was foolish leaving them here, but I like to take the coins out once in a while and look at them. But shouldn't you put them in a safe deposit box now? Bess asked. Nancy spoke up. Why don't we leave them here where the thief hid them? Otherwise, he'll know that the secret passageway has been uncovered and he won't even come into the library. Mr. Rorick agreed, and George replaced the books where she had found them. Mrs. Holman glanced nervously at her watch. Sometimes Fred comes early. We'd better close these doors and busy ourselves with some kind of work so he won't be suspicious. Fred arrived while the group was eating lunch. Mrs. Holman asked him to dust the hall where she knew he would overhear everything that was said. The afternoon plans were discussed. Soon afterward, everybody in the house except Fred prepared to leave. At two o'clock, all had left, and Mrs. Holman telephoned Fred at 2.30. By this time, Nancy, Bess, and George had sneaked back into the Rorick home and hidden behind some shrubbery. When they saw Fred carrying the trash to the woods, they dashed inside the house.
By three o'clock, the girls had gone through the secret passageway, closing both the openings, and secreted themselves behind furniture in the library. They never took their eyes off the chimney. At exactly 3.30, the secret door began to open. A man appeared in the opening and jumped down. He was Fred Jenkins' slightly built companion. The man wore gloves and was in his stocking feet. No wonder he never left any fingerprints or footmarks here, Nancy thought. The intruder went directly to the safe, knelt down, and slowly turned the dial back and forth. Then he swung the door open, grabbed the velvet case containing costume jewelry, which Mr. Rorick had put there, closed the safe, and started for the fireplace. He's not going to search this time, Nancy thought. If we don't capture him now, he may get away and take the coin collection with him. Quick as a panther, Nancy came from behind the sofa and made a leap for the thief. You're the phantom! Hands up! she cried. Nancy was counting on the fact that the thief would not turn around and discover that she had no weapon. Instead of complying, the man whipped a spray gun from his pocket and squirted it in Nancy's face. Instantly, she dropped unconscious and he leaped for the mantle. As George tried to block his way, he turned and gave her a dose of the knockout spray. She too blacked out and fell to the floor. Swiftly, the man climbed onto the mantle. Bess had looked on horrified. If she tried to stop him, no doubt he would give her the same treatment. Then she could not help her friends. Oh, what shall I do? Bess thought with a panicky feeling. End of chapter 19